So he says, the United States is Morocco. North America is Morocco. And I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He says, what then? How come the people in the United States had to get permission from Morocco all the way over there to do business over here in North America? Who gave permission to the British? Who gave permission to the Moors? We're going to stay tuned. Watch this. of the truth the truth law in history all right and this is going to be our open seminar so it's free to everyone we welcome you we welcome you we welcome you and uh, we're going to get into this thing today this is our first session our first session all right as we go into talking about uh, the truth Law in history, all right? So now, we're talking about Morocco, all right, versus the empire or the Moroccan empire versus uh, North America. And what's what and who's who and how this, this thing went down in North America. Okay, so we're going to get into it. we got a lot of documentation that we're going over today. Uh, so y'all stay tuned. This is a full seminar. I hope you all enjoy it. I hope you all are ready to take notes. Because we're getting ready to uh, get into this thing deep. All right. So now, as we go into this, we're dealing with, uh, and this is going to be uh, quite a few uh, topics that we're going to cover. So I want to invite you all, make sure you take notes because we're going deep. Now, what I want to do, first of all, I'm doing this session in response to uh some videos that were put up by a couple of people well one person in particular and so I'm going to go over some things that were said and you all are going to be able to go we have the full video that will be linked below and we're also going to have uh, our response to what was said by this character now uh, what we've got here is a situation where we're we have been told by several people that North America is Morocco. Okay, we've been told that North America is Morocco. Well, we want to dispel that because there are some things that have not been presented that we're going to present here today. And then I want to say to everyone, regardless of what you're calling yourself, whether you're calling yourself more or black, which I don't uh, suggest you be calling yourself or whatever it is you're calling yourself. Uh, the purpose of this session is basically to give you the information. You're not to believe me or anything I say. The only thing we're saying is listen to the information and go look it up for yourself. So we're going to present to you information that shows that there is a difference between these people and really who is who in what we call the Americas. Okay, so let's get into this. Uh, so now, first of all, uh, let's, what I want to do is I want to show you all some uh, some of the information that deals with the timeline of what was going on in the Americas. All right, so let's see if I can I can pull up this nice little timeline that I, I hope I put in here that that is uh, easy to find. Don't make me have to. All right, here we go. Activities in North America. So let's pull this up. And we're going to take a look at a timeline because it's going to be our basis of what we're dealing with today. All right. Now, if you all have any questions or comments, because uh, I know I, I've invited some people who are a little bit hostile. 
<laughs> to join us today. But, you know, listen, don't, this is not about being upset. This is not about disrespecting anyone. We just want to make sure we present the information to you. All right, so now let's take a look at this. All right, hello, T. Thank you for joining us. Let's see. Uh, we're going to take a look. I'm going to uh, flip the screen here. Now, this is a simple simplified timeline of activities in the North America. This is what we're going to go through. We're dealing with Columbus right here, and we're going to zoom into this. So uh, this basically in activities in North America. As I zoom in on this timeline, we're going from dealing with Columbus. Let me close this a little bit. Make sure everybody can see it. All right, so now. We're going into uh, from the time of Columbus up through uh, the time of the 1800s. All right. So let me zoom in once again. What we're going to be dealing with today is the Columbus era when he came in all the way up to the 1800s. That's the period that we want to cover. And that's a lot to cover. Uh, so what I want to do is get into that and help understand and explain what was going on during this time and during this era some thing, and present some information that we have not been presented with uh, as we go through this. Now, first of all, let me start from when we're talking about Columbus and who he came in here under, or let's say who he came into the territory under. Now, when we're talking about Columbus and that back, back in that era, one of the problems that we have been told with respect to history, we keep hearing these terms European. The Europeans came in here and the Europeans did this and that and that. All right, let, let's, let's clear up some things about who the Europeans were, who the British were, who Columbus was, who the Spaniards were. Now, Back in 1492, when we talk about Columbus's time, uh, Columbus, or, or uh, Spain rather, had been taken over by what we know of as the Moroccan Empire. All right? They had control of Spain, uh, Portugal, many of the other countries, of course, North Africa. And this is the territory that they were uh, claiming and uh, ruling over. Now, in 1492, the Sultan of Morocco, which was Boabdil, B-O-A-B-D-I-L, y'all look it up, 1492, he was defeated by Queen Isabella, and he was forced to turn over all of his territories. He seceded all of his territories to Queen Isabella of Spain. So now, this was in 1492 as well. Shortly thereafter, she was kicking everybody out of Spain who was not a Christian. If you weren't Christian, you were being kicked out or you're going to get killed. I was saying, you're going to get, you're going to leave, you're going to die, or you're going to convert. All right? So now at this time, Columbus was a convert. Let's understand what he converted from. All right? Columbus converted from either Judaism. Now, here's the deal. There's two stories when I do my research he was either a Jew or a Muslim all right now when you talk about Jews those are dark-skinned people back then in the 1400s when we talked about Jews you're talking about people who are coming from one of the 12 tribes of Israel that main tribe being Judah all right Jew J-E-W is a shortened version from Judah, which is the tribe of Israel. Now, let's understand that all those tribes, those were dark-skinned people, all of them. All those Jew tribes, they were originally dark-skinned people, all right? When you talk about Muslims, Muslims are converts from the Mosaic laws, meaning they switch from Mosaic laws to what we call Islam, all right? So when they, they basically are, once again, coming from that Israel tribe, which are dark-skinned people, melanated folks. So 
Columbus switched from being either a Jew or a Muslim to being a Christian. All right. He was a convert, meaning he was likely not an Albion, which is what we're being told today. So let's let's clear this up, because most of us by now know that there are people who are, quote unquote, whitewashing history, whereby they're putting a lighter face on the people of antiquity. What they're doing is they're turning it or, or inserting the Albion in a place where they originally were not. All right. This is how history is rewritten. So we understand and we know this. If you don't know this, then let me talk about Jesus and how you see this white, blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus character on, on your grandmama's Bible. Well, why is that? Well, because somebody is rewriting history with images. All right. Let's understand this because, uh, when we talk about Jesus, once again, that's a character that is said to have come from those 12 tribes of Israel who were all dark-skinned peoples. So if this Jesus character comes from the Israelites, which in the Bible is where it distinctly says he comes from, then there's no way he's going to be Albion. All right, so you see it right there with the Jesus character. Which think they did with Columbus. All right. So let's understand this. Columbus, when you do your own research, and that's what you're supposed to be doing, was a convert either from Jew or Muslim. Which means he couldn't have been no Albion. Secondly, let's understand who was running uh, at this time, who had taken over. Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. All right. They took over from the Sultan of Morocco in 1492, whereby they defeated him. All right. So when they took it over, then it, everything that was supposedly belonging to the Moroccan empire now belonged to Spain. All right. But let's understand who these Spaniards were. When we're talking about Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, those are dark skinned people. Those are melanated folks. Let me say melanated. They might've been amalgamated, meaning mixed with some Albion, but they were melanated folks. So we're being made to think that King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella were Albion, which they were not. All right. So now let's get into this because now Columbus has converted because he's either got to leave Spain or he's going to get kicked out. Well, Columbus now uh, decides he wants to go on a voyage because of whatever research he had done and he he knew that there were other lands. All right, so he has to convince King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella to fund his mission. He had to convince them to, they had to put money into his mission. Now, let me say this also. At this time, the Albion was really a slave. Those were uh, people who were getting kidnapped from around the planet by other Moors. They were not people who held any kind of title or land or nobility. Those were dark-skinned people who held that at this time, not Albions. So here you got this Columbus character who's going to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, talking about, hey, I want you to fund my mission. And then you got to ask yourself now, if Albion's were like at the bottom of the social totem pole, where did this Columbus character, first of all, get the knowledge of understanding how to sell? When you are selling, you got to have astrology, and numerology, and all kind of other stuff. Because they sailed using the stars. You got to know how to navigate. Where did he get that knowledge? You had to have gone to school. Somebody, I, I, somebody tell me a good astrology class anywhere today. Much less back then. So here you got this Columbus character who has knowledge of astrology. Then he's going to the king and queen. King and queen is saying... I need you to fund my mission. Now, if you are asking me to fund a mission for you to sail to a place that 
I don't really believe exists. You better be able to show me that you've been on other missions before, that you've uh, had other crews before, you've sailed ships before. If you can't tell me that, I'm not funding nothing. So if this Columbus character has done all of that, he knows astrology, he's sailed before, he's had crews, he knows how to put teams together, then this you telling me this is an Albion who back then they were slaves? These people were being kidnapped from around the planet. Okay, my first suggestion to you is, first of all, Columbus was not no Albion. And let me make sure we understand what I mean when I say Albions. I'm talking about light-skinned people. I'm talking about the people who were grafted from your melanated folks. The people who were manipulated whose DNA was specifically manipulated to make their skin light so if anybody's telling you oh well they skin got light because they weren't in the sun or whatever science shows that when you're talking about an Albion a light-skinned person that somebody manipulated that when they start talking about a recessive gene they're talking about a gene that's genetically modified all right so now there's your Albion who has been specifically grafted, supposedly created in Argentina and moved over to the colder lands. But then there's another light-skinned being that we're going to get into. Y'all got to understand the difference because y'all think skin color it makes the, the same people. That's not the case. Like they say, all skin folk ain't kin folk. That's very much real. And you got to get ready to understand uh why we keep falling into some of the situations we fall into because we assume somebody is our people just because of the color of their skin. All right? So we've got the queen and king of Spain who are melanated folks who have defeated the sultan of Morocco, dark-skinned, melanated being. And then we got Columbus who couldn't have been Albion because he came from the Jews or the Muslims, who's selling to the Americas. These are dark folk coming to the so-called, what we know of as the Americas today. So Columbus uh, comes into uh, the main or some of the, the islands surrounding or near the Americas. And, and this is in 1492, and he finds land. Now, let's understand this. Columbus was paid by Spain to take this journey. So anything Columbus found, that would have been under Spain, not under Morocco. So let's understand that when people keep trying to, uh, you know, they don't even uh, uh, attribute Columbus as being Moor. But he was a Moor. He was a Moor. And so let's understand, because I need to get into what the term Moor means, all right? For those of y'all who don't know, Moor is a verb, much like the term Smith. When somebody say Smithing, what does that mean? Smithing, you're making something, whether you're making it out of uh, metal or wood. It, it's a Smith. You're doing something. It's a verb, and that end up being somebody's last name, all right? Now, when we're talking about more, more is a verb, all right? Look it up, mooring, M-O-O-R-I-N-G, or M-O-O-R-E-D. What do they mean? More deals with a job done on a ship. It originally had nothing to do with skin color. What you talking about, Dava? Because all the boys keep telling me that more means dark skin and it mean black or more and it mean okay ask your more friends if there were albion moors they're going to tell you well yeah with some there's some white people who was moors when they high in sam hammage is you telling me that more had to do with dark skin if there was albion moors more means a job done on a ship these people coming over here into the lands they were moors they were sailors they were navigators moor means navigating or a job done on a ship 
So now you've got, you know, uh, uh, Columbus here. He sailed under Spain. So anything he finds, again, he's under contract. If I paid you to take this ship and I paid you for your ship and your crew and all this other stuff to go over here and find something and you find something, you selling under me. Anything you find is under me. This is clear. Y'all ever been in a, a, a college or a university and you go in, as a matter of fact, UPS was one of those companies that was created from somebody who was in a college. He did it while he was in school. And once he created it after he left the school, the school tried to take claim of it. <laughs> it was a big uh, fight about that. Because of the simple fact that if you're being paid by me, and as a matter of fact, this is the thing, the school wasn't paying him, he was paying the school. But when you're doing something under the guise of uh, an, an, an organization, then anything you do can be claimed by that organization. So if Spain is paying Columbus to go down here and sail, then, okay, whatever you find, that belongs to my company, Spain. All right. Now, I need to make some things clear because, uh, you know, I get a lot of people who will say, and Moors, because I'm going to go through some uh, documentations because, you know, we get quite a few things. We get, oh, oh, I don't need to talk about it right now. We're going to talk about it in a few seconds. I need to pull this up. I need to show some maps at the time because this whole idea that North America belongs to Morocco. Uh, let me get, I want to show you all. Let me get back to the, uh, this timeline. All right, let me flip this rig. All right, so we're zooming in here, all right, because I need to go over this first. This is when, we're talking about 1492, when Columbus sailed. This was a Spanish expedition, meaning he's under the Spaniards when he's sailing. This was in 1492, all right? Now, we have the 1600s. 1600s, this is when the British company comes into play in North America. Why is this important, Diva? This company right here is the very same company y'all know of as the state of Virginia today. The state of Virginia is a company that was one of the uh, original British colonies, but now when you say state of anything, that belongs to Britain to this day. State of anything, that's under British control to this day. Now, I need y'all to pay attention to something, because this right here is what we don't get told. This is very important. Once again, this is the 1600s, but before the 1600s, what y'all need to look up, look this up. Again, I'm telling you, I hope y'all taking notes. By the way, let let me hold up. I always tell y'all to pay attention. Y'all should be taking notes here because you're going to get paid for paying attention. You're going to get paid when you pay attention because there's going to be a test on this. UNA is putting up a test on all of these open seminars. If you want to get paid to pay attention, pay attention, take notes, because there's going to be a test on this, and for every answer you get right, well, you get love notes, love note currency, rather. There's a difference between the love note and love note currency. You're going to get love note currency so you can buy from our store or even trade it in for cash. All right, that's up to you. Now, let me get back to this. Pay attention. Take notes. In 1585, there's the Barbary Company. Y'all have heard of the Barbary Treaties? Well, that's because there's a Barbary Company. Well, who owned that? Britain owned this Barbary Company. Who was a part of the Barbary Company? Morocco, Tunis, Algiers, Tripoli, Montezuma. Why is that important, Diva? Well, because these 
this Morocco, this is the company that a country that everybody keeps saying is North America. Well, there's a problem with it because what we're not understanding is that at this time, Morocco and Britain were in bed together. This before uh, uh, Britain came into the U.S. with uh, the Vir Virginia Company. Britain and Morocco were in bed together. They were trading sugar was one of their big commodities. Sugar. And so what was going on is that they had made their own coalition whereby when Britain was doing something, Morocco didn't dare to step foot on the territory. What you talking about, Diva? Morocco, Morocco was running North America. Really? Okay, let's look at some maps. I'm going to pull up some maps so that we can see who was running what. This is important. All right. Now, I'm pulling up this map of North America. All right. Now, pay attention to this. Here are the colonies, all right, being run by what we know as the United States of America. I'm ready to get into who they were. Here's some unorganized territory. Here, down here, Florida was being run by Spain. There's a fight between the United States and Florida. Then, this right here, colony of Louisiana. This was being run by Spain, but at one point, the French had all of this under the Louisiana Purchase. So we got United States in here. We got uh, Spain in here. We got Russia in here. Hold up. Let me take a look at another map. All right. Let me pull this, pull this map up. All right, let's take a look at this map here. And let's see what's going on. Now, we're just looking at who owned everything in the Americas so we can understand about where the Moroccan Empire came in to effect. All of this is important is because we have to understand how they came into play. Now, the this is a legend showing which companies on what territories in the Americas. This is South America here and then North America up here at the top. So Spain is in the red, Portugal, Britain, Great Britain in the pink, United States in the green. And we're going to talk about who was running the United States. Uh, we got in the purple, Posh. Well, who is po Posh? P-O-C-C-H-R. Backwards R. France, Netherlands. All right, let's zoom in on this thing. Because down here, all this red right here, all of this red, that's Spain. This is in 1777 or 1794, according to this map. These are the Americas in the green. You got, hold up, Great Britain had territory, Russia had territory, France had territory. Uh, does anybody see Morocco up in here? Anybody? Uh, Morocco, where is, if this was owned by Morocco, where is Morocco running or ruling? Where is it? I'm looking at the map, and I'm, I'm still waiting on any map because I love it when, you know, when I have conversations with these Moors and they bring information. Because, see, let me be honest. Let, let me, let me, let me. Let me speak on this. When I'm doing this, my purpose is to find the facts. That's all I want. I just want facts. So when you present me with information, I'm going to go and research like crazy on that topic. Because I want to know everything about it. So when I'm doing this, it's not about an ego. It's not about, oh, you wrong. No, it is just about what 
are the facts so we can get to the truth. Now, that's what I'm doing here is presenting you with the facts, and then you can create your own truth. All right? I just want to present you with the facts. Now, getting back to this, where's Morocco? Uh, all these other territories, Spain, Portugal, uh, France, Russia, Netherlands, all got all got their own territory. I don't see no Morocco up in here. I had one time this guy, he was like, I said, where's Morocco? He zoomed in on this little dot. And the dot said M-A-U something. He was like, yeah, that's Morocco. I was like, it don't it don't even say M O. But you know, you can transform the letters anything in anything. Let me say this too, because one of the things I get is when when you're dealing with people who are working with the Moors, anything with the M-A or M-O, it, they want to uh, uh, equate that to more. Y'all got to watch out for that because, listen, again, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And I, I have been accused of misleading or what have you. The only thing I'm trying to do is present you with the facts, all right? And then you can determine for yourself where you want to go. But I had I heard someone say Moabites comes from the word more. No it don't. Cuz they want to tell you to call yourself a Moabite. All right, listen up. All y'all people who call yourselves Israelites, let's understand what Moabite comes from. All right. First of all, when we're talking about the Moabites, they were not a, a group that comes from the Israelites. They were like distant cousins of the Israelites. All right. So what happened is these people come from the, the lineage of Lot. Y'all got to understand this because I know y'all, y'all, some of y'all think the Bible is BS or whatever. The Bible has lies in it. Yes. Because those scriptures were taken and mixed up and redacted and retracted and everything else you can think of, changed around, switched around. But it still holds a lot of truth. That Bible is a history book. You got to do your research so that you can put that history in its right order. But it's a history book. So getting back to it, when we're talking about the Moabites, they're not Israelites, all right? The Israelites were their own lineage. The Moabites were like distant relatives or cousins to the Israelites. Now, who were the Moabites? Y'all know that story about how the two daughters slept with their father? Well, those are people who were coming out of what we know as Sodom and Gomorrah, all right? So these women slept with their father and had seeds. One of the sons was Moab. When you're talking about Moabites, you're talking about a group of people who come from incest, ancestry. Incest. That's, that's who they are. So I'm saying to you, before you want to be taking on these titles, know what you're talking about. Because here this guy is claiming that Moab means more. When you can go and look this up for yourself. I didn't make this up. This is what came from the Bible. This way he 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 got this where the term Moab come from. It means a group of people who come from incest. A lineage of people created from incest. All right. So, and they're not Israelites. So for those of y'all who claim to be Israelites, they're not the same. Hamites are not the same as Israelites. They are distant cousins of the Israelites. And we start talking about Asiatic or Asians. Are you talking about Japheth? Well, those are not Israelites. Those are distant cousins of the Israelites. They are what related according to the Bible. All right, let me get back to this because I need us to understand this timeline. Excuse me. I need us to understand this timeline, all right, and how these things go. So let me find this timeline. 
All right. Now, we're talking about how Morocco and Virginia, or excuse me, Morocco and Britain, rather, were already in bed together. The first company that was created by Britain in the Americas was the Virginia Company, that same company we know of as the state of Virginia today. Now, I told you all that when Columbus sailed, he sailed under Spain. And so any territory that supposedly belonged to Morocco would now belong to Spain. However, how did Britain get to come in here and run roughshod over the original people when Spain was the one who supposedly came and found, found it, found the territory? All right, let's understand uh, how that happened and what happened, all right? So, when... Britain came in because Britain has a lot of, uh, at that time they had a lot of power. And they came in and they started setting up their uh, companies. Now, what we need to understand is that the original people of the land gave Britain permission to be in the land. They made contracts. And we're going to look at this. Uh, please write this uh, website down. UNARepublic.com forward slash docs. Jazz, thank you for joining us. UNARepublic.com forward slash docs. All right. Go in and take a look at. I want you to pull down the list of treaties, and I'm going to show that right now. Uh, a list of the treaties that were created. Let's see if I can do this. All right. So when you go into UNA Republic, no, we're not what, Jazz? So when you go into UNARepublic.com, what you're going to find, let's see here if I can zoom in on this, is a list of the treaties that, were, that went on between the original people of the Americas and Britain. Why are these important, Diva? Because these documents tell the story of how the original people gave Britain permission to be in the land. These treaties, these treaties all tell the story of what really happened. Not only that, see, when you read these, this is why, for me, I want original documentation as close to it as possible. But when you read these treaties, you get to hear the ancestors speak. So what are we talking about? All of these treaties came before, uh, or the vast majority of them came before uh, the 1777, which is the Constitution. A treaty stands above a constitution. Treaty of Easton, October 1758. The Great Treaty of uh, 1722 between the five nations. Uh, 1726, Deed and Trust. Uh, the treaty held with the Indians of the Six Nations, 1742. 1744, 1752. All of these treaties are before 1777. Albany Congress, of Tre uh, Congress and Treaty of 1754, 17, uh, 1760. Again, all of these come before the Constitution, and these, the Middle Plantation Treaty of 1677, all of these, and when you go in, don't find a synopsis of these treaties. Don't, don't look up a synopsis. Go find the actual treaty and read it, and you will hear the ancestors speak. You will hear all of the deeds, or a lot of the deeds that were going on between the original people and Britain, and how they were being tricked out of the land, how the people were, the original people were trying to take back over the land. Go read them, and then you're going to see what really happened between Britain. And these are important because, here's the deal, let's talk about what was going on with these treaties. In these treaties, what was going on is that the original people were subjugating themselves to Britain, whereby they were agreeing 
to pay taxes all right but at the same time they also were putting the land in land patents which still exist to this day the land is in land patents in the name of the mothers in the name of the mothers the original people of the land all right and what you're going to find is that the names of these people wasn't no Ali, Muhammad, Bay, Day, L. No, they had, uh, you know what, I have a lot of people ask me, what's the name of the people, Diva? What was their names? All right, hold on. Because I don't like to, I will butcher these names, but I'm going to give you an idea. Uh, you got, uh, and these, these are the names that you're going to find in the treaties when you read them. Of course, Iroquois, the Shawnee, Pompton, T. T. D. Uskug. Uh, let me find some of the other names. Onondagas, Cayagues, Senequis, in Albany, the Mohawks, Mohawks. Uh, I said Seneki, Atawas Cory, uh, Dani Isori, Ane Jederat. All right. So, the Sakims, I mean, these names, you'll find them when you go through those treaties. Now, with that being said, those treaties are important because they created land patents. And they showed that the original people, some of them, not all of them, were choosing to be to pay taxes to Britain. Why? So they can vote, so they can be a part of the colony or the states. I see, I'm not going to go into it today because um, some of this becomes clear when you read certain things like the Three Fifths Clause. All right? It talks about those Indians who were not taxed. Well, if you weren't being taxed, that means you weren't a citizen. And if you weren't a citizen, then you couldn't vote. Your vote didn't count. You didn't vote. Okay? So, because some of the Indians chose to not be a part of the United States, and the other ones chose to subjugate themselves, whereby they would pay taxes, but when, with those land patents, by what they said, and they were very adamant about this, the name of the land must stay in the name of the people for our descendants. So that is a contract. This is why you can't go and talk about, oh, I'm a Moor, I'm a, uh, uh, my name is Drew Bahamut Bay. If you're trying to tap into those patents, you better know the names of the original people of the land. If you're not claiming that, you can't claim land. This is why you'll see these Moors put that tag on the end of the name of original tribes. Like the, the, the Washita Moors is not no Washita Moors. The Moors, let's go, let me talk about the difference between Moor and Moor. Y'all take notes. M-U-U-R dealt with those people coming from the land of Mu or Lemuria. That was a land that sat between what we know of as the Americas today and what we know of as Asia. There was a land between there. It was known as Lemuria. There were people who uh, uh, went from that land into what we know of as the Americas today. They're known as the Washita Moors, and they're known as the oldest living people on land today. That is not the same as a group called Moors coming from what we know of as Europe today or Africa. So let's go on that now. Let's get into that. What is the difference between these Europeans because what you will hear people say a lot is uh, the Europeans came over here and they did such and such I need y'all to understand something people there is this desire to divide us and keep us fighting with each other 
And the problem is we don't even recognize the difference between people. Because all we're looking at is skin color. And so let's, let's, let's get into this because when you see, hear people talking about the Europeans, what they, don't, what they want you to do, the first thought you got in your mind is an Albion or a light-skinned person. When the truth is that the original Europeans were dark-skinned people. The original Europeans were dark-skinned people. Even to this day, when you talk about the so-called modern European, they're not the same as the Albion. And we're going to get on that. They're not the same. All right. So how you know, Diva? All right. See, this is when we get into these terms, black and white. So I, I'm going to pull this up. I'm going to pull up the SF-181 form. I've gone through this with you guys before. But I'm going to go do it again because... Uh, it's clear that I need to do this so we can understand the difference between the terms uh, white and black. All right, and who the white people were and who the black people were. So I like to show you legal documentation. Why do I like to show you legal documentation? So you know Diva Lurie ain't making this up. You can go and look this up for yourself. All right, so this is legal documentation that's going to show you who the original, uh, who, who were white and who were black people. Now, let's understand this term black and white. They have nothing to do with skin color. I know I'm preaching to the choir because most of my people who are watching this, y'all are intelligent folks. You've done your research. You've heard this before. You know it. But for those two or three people out there listening who don't know that the terms black and white have nothing to do with skin color, let me break this down for you. All right. Originally, you had your black people were considered uh, people who have no legal standing or fictitious people. Now, originally, your black people were what we know of as white today. Your Albions. I don't say the term white because we need to make it clear who we're talking about. Your Albions. Who were your Albions? Those were the people, like I said, who were grafted, who were sent away to another land and whatever was done to them was done. But those were your Albions. Those were the ones who were considered black, coming from Ireland, coming from Sicily, coming from other areas where they were being kidnapped and brought into the Americas as slaves. They were, who was kidnapping them? Moors. Now, who, who were these Moors? Morocco. Al Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, Montezuma, they were being kidnapped by these states. All of these were what we call Barbary states. What are Barbary states? I told y'all, make sure y'all pay attention and take notes. These states were participating in what we call piracy, where they sail the seas and seize people's ships, take them over, and then sell everything on the ships. Piracy. And these barbaric companies came under treaty with what we know of as Britain. <clears throat> In the 1600s. 50, er, uh, late, late 1500s. Alright, I already showed you the map. We're going to get into it again. Now, getting back to it. Alright. <clears throat> when we're talking about the term white. White white means royalty. White means landowners. All right? White means purity of blood. Purity of blood. So when you start talking about white, it had nothing to do with skin color. And I'm going to show you information and proof of that when we look at this legal document SF-181 form which to this day is in effect 
with respect to showing you what the term white actually means. So I'm going to flip my rig and let's take a look at this SF-181 form. All right. Uh, once again, you can look this up. Look this up for yourself. Now, this is an ethnicity and race identification document. All right. Now, what I want to focus on here is these terms here. These are the categories that they give you when you're talking about race. Either you can choose American Indian or Alaska Native. You could choose Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian, or White. Now, first of all, notice here where when they're giving you the definition, they all say a person. This is why, you know, people come to me about the SF-181 form, and I have to make it clear to them, it doesn't matter what you're choosing on here. If you're choosing anything, you're talking about a corporation, a dead fictitious entity, because that's what a person is. Now, it can include a human, but when these people talk about a person, they are talking about a dead fictitious entity, and that's it, because that's the only thing they can deal with, is a person, a dead fictitious entity. All right, so now, when we're talking about the term black or African-American, <laughs> I, I'm not going over all these terms because I've broken this down in my session called Terms Melanated People Should Think Twice Before Calling Themselves. But it says a person having origins of the black racial groups of Africa. All right. So why is this an issue? First of all, have y'all noticed? I don't know if y'all have ever met people from that continent called Africa. For the most part, they don't like to call themselves African or even... You say, where are you from? I'm from Mali, Mali, uh, uh, Senegal. They're not talking about no Africa. And those who know, they don't even want to use the term Africa because they know it's more of a slave master term or a colonizer term. Now, we're talking about racial black. Black means having no standing. It doesn't have nothing to do with skin color. But they want you to think you're black. So did you say, yeah, I'm, I'm from, and they want you to think you're from Africa. So you say I'm from Africa, and then you, you choose this. Now I need y'all to understand something real quick. All these categories here, they have to do with how much of your estate that they're controlling that you're going to get by law. They, when they're under control, when they have fiduciary control of your estate, they got to give you something. They got to give you something. What they give you and how much a piece of your pie that they give you is going to be determined by what you claim here. So if you, you claiming to be black, well, you're going to get a piece of crumb of that crust of that pie that your mother created for you. Because you claiming to be black, which means you don't have any legal standing, you're ignorant, and you don't have any, you, you don't have any status. You're stateless. Because you said you're from Africa, which is not even uh, claiming a country. You just claim the land mass. That means you're stateless. All right. Now, uh, American Indian. All right. This is when they're giving you a larger piece of the pie. When you get to uh, get some land. And they're going to put you up on the land. They're going to give you some, uh, some, some uh, money, some benefits over here. A person having origins, person having origins in any of the original peoples of North America, South America, including Central America, who maintains tribal affiliation or community attachment. All right. Then you, get, you, you, get some, you might get some land on a reservation somewhere. All right. But when you claim to be white, I won't go over Asian and Native, Native, Native Hawaiian. Y'all go look at that. This one right here, though, white. I want to get into this one. A person having origins in any original peoples of Europe. Now, I need y'all to pay attention because 
because the original original this says Europeans the original Europeans were dark-skinned people who were the original Europeans this used to this did they change this I need to go back and look at this this used to say original Europeans <laughs> they changed it all right so this used to be the original Europeans uh, okay now the original Europeans were Montezuma again Moroccans Tripoli Tunis Algiers all right even when you start talking about uh, Britain those were your original Europeans all right those were dark-skinned people even see when you start talking about Britain see some of y'all forget when we talk about King James King James that Bible came out in the 1600s King James was a melanated dude he was not Albion he was melanated his his daughter Elizabeth she was melanated again we're talking about the 1600s so this thing is still in effect today where we're talking about the original Europeans the people of the Middle East those are dark-skinned people Middle East is where the Israelites were coming from that area over there where uh, Saudi Arabia is those dark-skinned folks or North Africa uh, here we talking about Morocco those are dark-skinned people when we're talking about white we're not talking about the skin color we're talking about people who were of royalty elite folks people who had money that's who these people were dark-skinned folks so y'all looked at up the SF-181 form so that you can understand what these terms really mean because to this day there are still clues in these documents. They're changing some things because that used to say the original Europeans. Also understand this. What we know as Africa today was originally Europe. What we know as Europe today, that was originally Africa. Y'all got to go look this up. Because even what we know as Africa today, originally it was Ethiopia. Before that, it was all that territory over there. The Middle East, Asia, all that was uh, Asia's. Then it was Ethiopia. And it went to Africa when they started splitting up the territory. But your original Europeans, those were dark-skinned people, Moroccans. Tunis, Algiers, Tripoli, Montezuma, Britain, all of those were your original Europeans. All right, so I'm going to move on uh, so that y'all can understand what's going on. Now, I need to go back to this timeline because I need to go back to the question the guy asked. One of the questions this guy in this video asked, he's like, why, why is, uh, the, do, do the people in uh, Americas have to go and ask permission from the Sultan of Morocco to get permission to be here? All right. Let's understand some things as we go into this. The United States of America, the original, and notice I'm saying of America, the United States of America the original United States was created in 1777. All right. That was being run by a group of what I call elite Moors. Don't confuse this, people, because these people were not a part of Morocco. They didn't want to be associated with Morocco and all these other places. They were like, no, we, 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 we separate. They came into the Americas and they set up things that we know of as counties today. So you understand there were separate two separate governments running on top of each other. All right. There are these elite Moors and I want to help you all understand why I call them elite Moors. What made them elite was their knowledge. All right. They had a higher knowledge of the law. And when I say knowledge of the law, I'm not talking about these earthly laws. I'm not talking about man's laws. I'm talking about people with knowledge 
of the universal laws that know how to manipulate different dimensions. I'm talking about people with a serious knowledge of how to manipulate people and how to run governments. That's what these elite Moors knew. And so when they came in, they're, they're, first of all, let's understand this. There already was a government in the Americas. The original people had a government and they had a constitution. We know of it as the Iroquois Confederacy. Please go to unarepublic.com forward slash docs, D-O-C-S. unarepublic.com forward slash docs, D-O-C-S, and pull down the Iroquois Confederacy. There are two of them up there. Read both of them. It's not a long document, but that was their constitution. All right? So now, here comes these elite Moors who established what we know of as counties. This is why, to this day, counties are the highest form of government on land. Counties. So you've got counties, but then you've also got the states running over here owned by Britain. All right, so we're coming up into the 1777. And what is the problem here? What's going on is that you've got these elite Moors in the land. These are dark-skinned people. And then you've got these British in the land with the states. And then you've got the original people in the land. All right, the original people gave both Britain and these elite Moors permission to come in and set up shop in the states on the land. And we're going to show proof of that. First of all, you can see, you already saw proof where we talked about uh, all of those treaties made between the original people and Britain. Go look those up. Look up the treaties. All right, they're going to make it clear that there was contracting going on between Britain and the Americas. Or the Britain and the Indians, rather. The original people of the land. I don't even like to call them Indians, but the original people of the land. All right. So now, when we get back to these elite Moors, let's understand that they were given permission by the original people to be in the land. Well, how do we know this diva? See, see somebody, one, one of the guys said in this video, he said, well, you can't do research and find this. Well, yes, you can. When you do true research, you're going to find the information because all you, when you ask the spirits to send something to you, they're going to send it. So let's understand this. And we're going to go over a document that shows that the original people gave permission to these elite Moors to be in the land and that there were treaties already set up whereby they were supposed to be respecting it. So when these elite Moors start establishing this constitution, they based that constitution off of the Iroquois Confederacy. And so one of the things we have to also keep in mind is we've been told, again, going back to the whitewashing, the whitewashing of history. We've been made to think that, oh, these uh, Europeans came in. Yeah, well, the Europeans were dark-skinned folks. The ones who, who created the Constitution, those were dark-skinned people. They were under uh, Muslim or Islam. They were not trying to be a part of Morocco and all of that. They were like, no, nah, we separate. We're we not, we not, we not with that. But they were... Uh, a group of people who understood how to establish governments. This is where your counties come from. What do counties mean? Counties mean to count things. Count. So keeping records of what land this person say they own, what property this person say. That's, that's what counties were. All right. So now you got these elite Moors that have set up these counties, but they didn't call themselves Moors. You know what they call themselves? Americans. Let me, let me help y'all understand what the term American means. A Mary is a Hebrew term, meaning copper colored. Copper colored. That's what a Mary means. Ika, I-C-A, or I-K-A, means land of the indigenous people. 
America means land of the copper colored people. So when we talk about Americas, we're talking about everything from North America to South America. Land of the copper colored people. Now, remember I said that a Mary is a Hebrew term. And th these people coming in, well, they spoke Hebrew. We talk about the Jews, those original Jews with dark skin. When we talking about uh, uh, Muslims, and that's where this, you know, this constitution comes from. A, you know, a, a different group of of what we call elite Moors who came into the land and started establishing government, but they had to get the permission of the original people to be in the land. Well, how do we know that, Diva? I'm going to read a document. And you're going to be able to go to pull, go and pull it down from unarepublic.com forward slash docs. And you can read that original document that I discovered for yourself where it is these quote unquote Indians or the United Indian Nation that's writing to the United States and saying, hey, I thought we was brothers. What are y'all doing? You know, we were supposed to have peace. We gave y'all permission to be in the land. We kept we keep asking y'all not to encroach on this land. We're going to read that. So that you can see it for yourself that there is proof that the original people gave permission not only to Britain, but to these so-called elite Moors who were in the land establishing counties. So you got your counties being established by your elite Moors, and then you've got The states created by Britain. Let's go through it. I'm going to put this up so that you all can see. Uh, so that you all can take a look at this for yourself. Uh, once again, go to unarepublic.com forward slash docs. And you're going to be able to get a see these documents for yourself. I'm just going to put them up so that you can see them. But I'm going to read them as I had to uh, translate them for myself. I had to rewrite them because I couldn't. It's, not a, it's a document that's more difficult to read because of the way they used to write back in the day. But this is the actual writing of somebody who uh, transcribed this meeting of the Indians. So give me one second. And I'm going to pull this document. All right, and, and this is this is an important document, by the way. So I hope y'all go and read it. UNARepublic.com forward slash dots d o c s. Uh, this is an important document for the simple fact that um, it also shows you names. One of the things that I keep uh, finding is that we're not recognizing that, again, there were names. These people, there were names on these documents. All right, so I'm going to pull this up so that you all can see it. I'm flipping my rig. All right, hold on. So... This is what the original document looks like right here on the left. All right, so now I'm going to read this. This is a speech of the United States Indians Nation at their con Confederate Council held near the mouth of Detroit River between the 28th of November and the 18th of December 1786 so if anybody uh, you want to do your research or whatever go, check out these lands we're talking about Detroit here the Detroit River and we're going to get into this now pre present present at this meeting uh, again this is in 1786 it was the five nations the Hurons, Delaware, uh, Shakwanese, Ottawa's, Chiparos, uh, Patuatians, 
excuse me for butchering these names, uh, Tevichi Wees, Cherokees, uh, the Wabash Confederate, all right? So, to the Congress of the United States of America, and I'm reading this document. I'm reading this document because I need y'all to hear how these original people of the land were addressing the United States. The Congress, to the Congress of the United States of America, brothers of the United States of America, it is now more than three years, once again, this took place in 1786, it is now more than three years since peace was made between the King of Great Britain and you. But we, the Indians, were disappointed finding ourselves not included in the peace according to our expectations. For we thought that its, its conclusion would have promoted a friendship between the United States and Indians and that we might enjoy that happiness that formerly cultivated between we and our elder brethren. So right here is already stating, look, we, we had a relationship already. We were happy. We already talked to you all about being a land in the land and we gave you permission. We have received two very agreeable messages from the 13 states. We also received messages from the king. Right there is telling you we have been communicating not only with the states of Britain, but the king as well, whose war we engaged in des uh, desiring us to remain quiet, which we accordingly complied with during the times uh, this tranquility we. Uh, so they complied with this order or this desire from uh, the king and the United States as well, you know, to, to, to stay quiet in the matter. All right. So during the times of this tranquility, we were deliberating the best method we could form a, uh, we could, the best method we could form a lasting reconciliation with the 13 United States. Please at this time, Pleased at this time, we thought that we were entering upon a reconciliation and friendship with a set of people born on the same continent with ourselves. Certain that the quarrel between us was not of our own making, in the course of our council, we imagined we hit upon an excitement or agreement that would promote a lasting peace between us. Now, right here, they're saying, hey, we thought we were cool. We thought we were friends. We thought that y'all, once you got this peace, this, this treaty between you and Britain, that everything was going to be good. But no, we, we still being ignored. Does that sound similar to anything going on in the United States today with melanated folk who think they've been ignored all the time? Does this sound anything similar? I'm going to tell you in a few minutes why these uh, uh, so-called Indians were being ignored. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened with what these uh, people had done behind the backs of the original people of the land. So it goes on to say, brothers, we are still of the same opinion as to the means which may tend to reconcile or connect us to each other. And we are sorry to find, although we had the best thoughts in our minds during, during the before mentioned period, mischief has never uh, happened between us, you and us. We're still anxious of writing our plans of accommodation to execute and we shall briefly inform you of the means that seem most probable to us of affecting a firm and lasting peace and reconciliation. These people are begging for peace. They're begging to reconcile with the United States. These are the original people of the land. We are still anxious of writing our plans. Now, the first step towards which should, in our opinion, be that all treaties, listen up, y'all better pay attention, because this is where, once again, they're making it clear we have already claimed our land. A treaty is a document that's created between two sovereigns dealing with a tract of land. So when the original people present a treaty to the United States, they are saying this is our land and this is the rules of our land. So it says the first step 
towards this reconciliation. Which should, in our opinion, be that all treaties on carried on the United States, that all, let me say it again, the first step towards which should, in our opinion, be that all treaties carried on with the United States on our part should be with the general voice of the whole Confederacy and carried on in the most open manner without any restraint on either side. All right, especially and especially uh, land matters are often the subject of our councils with you, a matter of greater importance and of general concern to us in case we hold it absolutely necessary that any session of our land should be made in the most public manner by the united voice of the confederacy holding partial treaties as void and of no effect okay what just was said here what was just said here is any kind of treaty that we've made between you all that needs to be made public and that any kind of partial treaty is void and null and any time you are uh, giving up, any time you're saying that we're giving up our rights to our property, that needs to be made public. And so they're saying, we, we, we're not agreeing to this. Y'all got these partial treaties going on. We didn't agree to that. This, this right here, this, this document right here is everything that shows proof that these people have claimed their land. Brothers. We think it's owing to you that the tranquility which since the peace between us has not lasted and that essential good has been followed by mischief and confusion. Let me say it again, because they're blaming the actions of the United States that the peace has broken down. We think it's owing to you that the tranquility, which since the peace between us has not lasted, and that the, that that essential good has been followed by mischief and confusion, having managed everything respecting your own way. You kindled council fires where you thought proper without consulting us, as which you held separate treaties and have entirely neg uh, neglected our plan of having general conference with the different nations of the Confederacy. What did they just say? You didn't consult us. You kindled your fires wherever you thought you wanted to. You didn't show any respect for what we had laid down in our land. This is clear, clear proof that the original people gave these, uh, pe these uh, Moors who were running what we call the United States of America. And there's a difference between the United States and the United States of America. We're going to get into that a little bit. But these Moors... These elite Moors, they weren't of Morocco or any place in particular. Some of them were from Morocco, but they weren't in any place in particular. But they were calling themselves Americans. But they were being very, very disrespectful to the original people of the land. And this is clear, so I'll read it again. We think it is owing to you that the tranquility which since the peace between us has not lasted and that that essential good has been followed by mischief and confusion. Having managed everything respecting your own way, you kindled your council fires where you thought proper without consulting us at which you held separate treaties and have entirely neglected our plan of having a general conference with the different nations of the Confederacy. Who's the Confederacy? These are, y'all better understand what Confederacy means. Con in Spanish means with Federacy. Federal, federal means a contract or a covenant with God. Who were the gods? Those were the original people, the Indians. The Confederacy was them. Had this happened, we have reason to believe everything would now have been settled between us in, mo in a most friendly manner. All right, once again, you can go to unarepublic.com forward slash docs and you can find these documents. These are the originals and you can read them for yourselves. 
We did everything in our power at the Treaty of Fort Hanwicks to induce you to follow this plan as our real intentions were at the very time to promote peace and concord between us and that we might look upon each other as friends having given you no cause or provocation to be otherwise. These people begging for peace. And they're saying, we put down a treaty and a contract. You have not been respectful of it at all. They go on to say, brothers, notwithstanding the mischief that this has happened, we are still sincere in our wishes to have peace and tranquility established between us, earnestly hoping to find the same inclinations in you. We wish, therefore, you would take into consideration and let us speak to you in the manner we propose. Let us have a treaty with you early in the spring. Let us pursue reasonable steps. Let us meet halfway for our mutual convenience. We shall then bury in oblivion this misfortunes that have happened and meet each other in a footing of friendship. These people begging for peace. This is the original people talking to those who are running the United States of America who were Moors. These were melanated people. And we get ready to go into what these people were doing to the original people. So these original people, this is a documentation. These are the ancestors speaking right here. They're telling you uh, these people uh, claiming to be running the United States of America. They are not being respectful. Brothers. We say let us meet halfway and let us pursue such steps as become upright and honest men. We beg that you will prevent your surveyors and other people from coming upon our side of the Ohio River. We have told you before we wish to pursue just steps and we are determined the sh uh, they, they shall appear just and reasonable in the eyes of the world. This is the determination of all of the chiefs of the Confederacy now assembled here, notwithstanding the accidents that have happened in our villages, even in, uh, when in council where several incidents and in innocent chiefs were killed when absolutely engaged in promoting peace with you, the 13 United States. They killed them. They killed some of the chiefs when they were in meetings for a peaceful resolution to whatever this going through. Although then the interpreted chiefs here present still wish to meet you in the and the king for the before mentioned good purpose when we hope to speak to each other without either uh, menace. All right, so brothers again, we again request of you the most earnest manner to order your surveyors and others that mark out land to cease from their activities on the Ohio until we shall have spoken to you because the mischief that the mischief that has recently happened has originated in that quarter. We shall likewise prevent our people from going over until that time. He's saying, listen. Y'all doing stuff in Ohio, up there near Ohio. We're telling y'all to chill out because there's a lot of deaths going on. And we're asking that you all meet with us so that we can get all this taken care of and people can stop being killed. Once again, these are the original documents that you can find at unarepublic.com forward slash docs. Now, brothers... Lastly, it, it shall not be our faults if the plan we have suggested to you should not be carried into execution. In that case, the event will be very precarious. And if fresh ruptures ensue, we hope to be able to exculpate or show that we are not guilty of wrongdoing ourselves and shall most assuredly with our limited force be obliged to defend those rights and privileges which have been transmitted to us by our ancestors. If we should be thereby reduced to misfortune, the world will pity us when they think of the amical proposals we now make to prevent the unnecessary effusion of blood. Now what's sad about this is they are saying 
we know the world is watching. And if they know that we are trying to make uh, concessions with you all to keep from shedding blood, when they see this, they're going to pity us. And I'm saying to you, this is what's been hidden. Nobody knew that these uh, original people, they don't know the difference between the, the elite Moors versus what we call Europeans versus Moroccans versus Britain. They think they're all the same, but they're not. There were elite Moors running what we know as the United States of America. And then Britain was running the colonies. And we're going to talk about how we know that in a few seconds. <laughs> Done at our Confederacy Council fire at the Huron Village near the mouth of Detroit River, December 18, 1786. We got the five nations, Hurons, Thawanese, Delawares, Ottawas, Chippewas, uh, Putinantias, uh, Trish Tweez, Cherokees, the Wabash Confederacy. Notice, did y'all see anything in here about El Bay, uh, Muhammad, Day, El? You don't see none of that. These are the names of the original people of the land. Th those are the families. And a true copy of that was done Josh Brands. This is the speech from the United Nations uh, to the Congress of the United States of America. Now, What I need to go over and I need to make clear about is that there is probably a question about, well, what's the difference? You know, you had the Leap Moors was running North America. Now, what happened is that there were a group of Moors running what we know as the United States of America. And then there was, in 1777, this Constitution came about, the Declaration of Independence came about. Why was this happening? Is this how we going to know that these were some Moors in the state? Now, before 1777 came into effect, there was these counties that came into effect. The counties. Again, that on the private side, that's the highest form of government to this day. What you talking about, Diva? I'm going to tell you where you can see this, all right? When somebody's talking about land and evicting you from that land, who are they going to call? The sheriff. The sheriff is with the county. The sheriff is the highest governing agent on land. The highest governing agency on land is the county. They call in the sheriff because the county deals with land. All right? Now, at this time, you got, again, your elite moors establishing your counties. You've got Britain that has established the states. Y'all notice they different till this day? You got the county. You got the city. You got the state. And you got the federal. You talking about federal and city is the lines are blurred, but state, that's still dealing with Britain to this day. State of this, state of that. Counties are dealing with the private side. Okay? To this day. And when you know law, you know how to get them to do what they're supposed to do by law as a county. Now, I won't go into all of that because I need to get into this history and understand what's going on. Now, in 1777, this declaration comes about. Let's understand what was going on between Britain who had rule of the states. They were being treacherous. If you go and read the Declaration of Independence, you will see what Britain was doing back then. Well, it's what they still doing to this day, where they are they will kidnap people, uh, arrest them, uh, have a trial. The trial uh, won't uh, have anything to do with what the, the 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 case is. Lock them up for no reason. 
All kind of different treacherous stuff. And again, if you read the Declaration of Independence, you're going to see it clearly. You're going to say, wait a minute, that's what they doing? That's what they doing today. See, if you understand the game, Britain is still running what we know as the United States. Not the United States of America, but the United States. They're still running it to this day. All right? So now, so Britain was in here doing all of their treacherous deeds. And then you got these Moors who have established what we know as these counties. And they're like, you know what? You know what? We get ready to separate. We get ready to separate from Britain. We don't want Britain over here no more. And so they, they have written this Declaration of Independence and, and all of these other documents to separate. Again, this is uh, where they Now, I need you to understand something. United States of America, as well as United States, they're both corporations. They're both corporations. Both of them. But the United States of America was a corporation that was established by these quote-unquote elite Moors. So when they establish this corporation, what they're doing is kicking Britain's rule out. Now, y'all got to understand, these states that Britain uncreated, those are corporations where they were getting taxes and tax money. Wait, wait a minute, you're going to cut my money off? Some of y'all understand what that's like when you go and establish an account on YouTube and they demonetize your, your whole setup. Yeah, that's what it's like. They demonetize Britain and they were getting money off of the original people of the land. Because when you talk about colonists, the original colony, the people of the colonies were the original people of the land because some of them chose to pay taxes and subjugate themselves to Britain. Well, now this declaration comes along and you mean you're ready to cut off my money? Oh, no, nah, we're going to fight about this. Now you got the Revolutionary War. I'm going to flip this rig. We're talking about right here, United States of America, 1777, where now there's this Revolutionary War between 1775 and 1783, between the United States of America, which is these elite Moors, and Britain. These are, these are dark-skinned folks here running this Americas. Britain, these are melanated folks. They amalgamated, but they melanated. So, and remember, all royalty was originally uh, melanated folks. All royalty was originally melanated folks. And so, again, when you go back to King James, that was in the 1600s right here. He had a daughter, Elizabeth. She was uh, melanated all the way up until this point right here in the mid-1800s. So these are melanated folks. You got the original people who, who are uh, 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 dark-skinned people, copper color. And then you got uh, these, uh, these Moors who are running the United States of America. These are three different groups of dark-skinned people battling each other at this time. So I need y'all to understand something. What happened here? Why didn't he? Because one of the questions one of these guys asked, why didn't they get permission from the original people? As we see, these people originally did get permission from the original people and then started ignoring them. Let me tell you what happened. Because remember in, in that letter, that Indian says to him, hey, it's been three years. When he wrote that letter, it was 1776. He said, it's been three years since you all had a treaty between you and Britain. It's been three years, right? That goes back to here. Uh, 1773. Well, they had made a treaty between the United States of America and Britain. Because that guy was like, hey, what, we thought we were going to have peace. We brothers and whatnot. But let me tell y'all what these elite Moors, these so-called brothers, people who had made deals with the original people did. They had declared the original people as dependents. Yeah. Black, 
colored, and Negro is what they had started calling the original people of the land. It was these people running the United States of America. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, let's understand these people who was running the United States of America. This before George Washington, by the way. This is before George Washington. George Washington didn't come into the picture until 1789. Now, George Washington, let me rephrase that, because he, he was in the military. George Washington was fighting in this military battle. But there were presidents of the United States starting in 1777. But the people who were running the United States of America, these people were Moors, these dark-skinned folks, and they had n declared that the original people of the land were Negro-colored black dependents. And they had no legal standing. That was done by some dark-skinned people. These are the same people who started enslaving the original people of the land. Those were dark-skinned people who started enslaving the original people of the land. So let's make it clear. When we talk about Europeans, and, and so them, Europeans did, them Europeans, don't look at them as Albion because they weren't the same people. The Albion wasn't the ones who came over here and enslaved the original people. No, that was a dark-skinned group of people from Morocco, Tunis, Algiers, Tripoli, Montezuma, Britain. Those are the people who did that. So, in getting to this, and I, I see I have some comments. I'm going to try to get to those comments before I get out of here. I just want to make sure I cover uh, all of these uh, statements that were coming about this particular time. And y'all got to understand, when we're talking about black, Negro, and colored, those are terms, first of all, that were originally placed on the Albion, not melanated folks. They were originally placed on the Albion, not melanated folks. And they mean people who have, excuse me, no standing. No legal standing. They mean fictitious people. I gotta, I gotta address something because this character, because I, you know, I talked about the copper colored people. Now, this character decides to switch my words around and say, oh, she called herself colored. Because <laughs> I'm copper colored. All right. Where's my penny? Do I have a penny? I was trying to see if I have a penny up here. You take a penny and put it up to your skin. You copper colored. You wanted the original people of the land, supposedly. Now, when we're talking about colored, I didn't say I was colored. Diva ain't colored. Colored means a fictitious person or fictitious, something fictitious. When we're talking about colored people, those weren't even melanated folks. Those were the Albions. And I'm saying Albion specifically because I need to, for us to understand who even today the European is. What they call modern European, they're not your typical Albion. All right? Uh, I need to go over, let me go over that. Let, 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 let me go over that real quick. Who is who today? Who is who today? Now, what I try to avoid is using terms like we, us, them, they, because that allows people to muddy the history. Because they want to clump everybody who has melanin in their skin into a group of being Moors. That's like, you know, today, people saying anybody who's dark skinned, oh, they African American. What the hell? Wait a minute. I, uh, no, you're not. No, I'm not. No, African American. When you say more, you're talking about, see, the term more comes up. You'll see that in that document called the Peace and Friendship Treaty. I got I to gotta go over this document. I can't not go over this document. One of the big topics that people bring up to me is uh, that Washington's letter to Morocco. We can go over that right now. Let me bring that up. Uh, Washington's letter to Morocco. Why is that letter important? Because when we start talking about uh, 
whenever we start talking about uh any kind of proof or anything, people bring up George Washington's letter to Morocco. All right, I had it up here, but I got so many things on this thing. We're going to go into this George Washington's letter to Morocco. And this is what a lot of people don't uh, pay attention to because... They've been told by the Moors, yeah, George Washington let it, wrote a letter to Morocco, and in it, it said, okay, let's go over that, because I can't get out of here without going over that. Uh, George Washington's letter to Morocco, as I told you, George Washington was around, uh, you know, before he came, became president. As a matter of fact, it was George Washington who was pivotal in the treaties that came between uh, the United States of America and these Barbary companies, countries. So George Washington writes this letter to the Sultan of Morocco. And George Washington, by the way, I need y'all to understand. If y'all ever take, go and take a look at George Washington and, and, and his writings, you're talking about somebody who had a way with words George Washington know how to make somebody feel like they are so important. He was a great politician. George Washington. That's why he would be considered the first president, which he really wasn't. There was more than six presidents before him. But this guy was a serious politician. He was a serious politician. We're going to read this letter that he sent to the Sultan of Morocco in 17. 89. Now, let me preface this because I need to preface all of that other stuff going on beforehand. Um, in seven, by the time uh, 1788, 1787 uh, rolls around, the Queen of England is trying to get her colonies back. She's trying to regain control. And one of the things that England or Britain or these people who are running it, these what I would call your modern Europeans who are running it to this day, they are very good at infiltrating something. The way they take over something, they're going to infiltrate it from the inside and then control it with regulations from the outside. That's what they're doing right now. That's what they did with uh, the United States of America. That's what they're doing with Bitcoin. That's what they're doing with a whole bunch of other things that you're not recognizing. Any, any of these, uh, the, uh, what do we call it, the Morris Science Temple of America, they infiltrate it from the inside and then control it from the outside. It's, it's infiltrated. All right, so let's understand what's going on when we deal with uh, this letter to the Sultan and what's really going on. George Washington comes into the game as president, and these elite Moors who were running the United States, they were telling Morocco, because, by the way, let, let's go back into this. I told y'all there was a war that ensued where Britain was like, we're going to fight you for my, for my colonies. You're not going to just take over my companies. When that, after the war, the, Britain got their butt kicked. Britain got their butts kicked. And so at this time, what they did is they, they phoned in Morocco. Because <laughs> Morocco wasn't in the picture up until 17, uh, shoot, the 1780s. Morocco wasn't in the picture. And they called, Britain called, you know, I say call, but they sent a, a notice to Morocco letting them know, hey, I had a treaty between you and me, Britain. You and me had a treaty. Well, we are no longer over the territory of the United States of America anymore, so you are welcome to go in and wreak havoc on the United States of America. Britain sick the dogs on the United States of America, which was Morocco. Now, y'all got to understand, Morocco and Britain, they in bed together. Morocco and Britain were in bed together since the, the Barbary Treaty, which took place in the late 1500s. So Morocco was not trying to mess up their gravy train. They was not going to come up in the Americas and try to do things against Britain. That wasn't going to happen. But when Britain got kicked out 
and Britain called on Morocco who had muscle. Well, Morocco came in and started seizing the ports of the uh, of, of, uh, United States of America. They started uh, stealing their ships. And they were telling them, look, the United States of America, if you want these ships back, then you're going to pay us tribute. And the, the elite morals of the United States, I was like, we ain't paying you damn thing. We ain't paying you nothing. We, you don't get no money here. You're not getting nothing. And so they were refusing to pay tribute to Morocco. It was these elite Moors that were refusing, refusing to do that. So when George Washington comes in in 1789, you got to understand who is George Washington. He is a direct descendant of the Queen of England. George Washington is a direct descendant of the Queen of England. He wasn't never supposed to be president in the first place. Because one of the things about presidents is uh, the 13th Amendment. Y'all look up the original 13th Amendment. I hope y'all taking notes and paying attention. If you want to get paid for paying attention. The original 13th Amendment dealt with royalty. Not that 13th Amendment y'all know today where it enslaved everybody. No. The original 13th Amendment dealt with royalty. Meaning, if you have royal blood, you cannot be president. All this king, queen, duchess. No, you can't be none of that if you're going to be president. Well, George Washington was a direct descendant of the Queen of England. He wasn't even qualified if they had known to be president in the first place. All right. So now, Washington comes in as president. He's really a crony. And he writes this letter to the Sultan of Morocco. Let's take a look at it. See if I can get it pulled up here. Sultan of Morocco. This says, let's see if I can pull this up. <clears throat> All right. Since the date of the letter, so he's sending this to Sidi Mohammed. Since the date of the letter which the late Congress by their president addressed to your Im Im imperial majesty, the United States of America have thought it proper to change their government. This, at this time, they have written a, another constitution. The original constitution for the United States of America still stands. But this guy comes in, George Washington, with a whole other constitution, well, revamped constitution, and to uh, institute a new one. Agreeable to the Constitution of which I have honor of herewith enclosing a copy. So he's sending him a copy of whatever the new Constitution George Washington had created. The time necessary employed in this arduous task and the derangements occasioned by so great through peaceful revolution will, will apologize and account for your majesty not having received those regular advices and marks of attention from the United States, which the friendship of magnanimity of your conduct towards them afforded reason to expect. So now, let's understand something. This is where the, the United States was like, we ain't paying you nothing. We're not giving you no tribute. What we want you to do is get yourself out of our ports so we can do business. All right, the United States having unanimously appointed me to supreme executive authority in this nation, your majesty's letter of the 17th of August, 1788, which by reason of the dissolution of the government remained unanswered, has been delivered to me. So he's saying, look, we're sorry we didn't answer it, uh, but, you know, I didn't have it until now, so I just got it. So I have also received the letters which your imperial majesty has been so kind as to write in favor of the United States to Bashal of Tunis and Tripoli, two of the other barbaric companies, or Barbary companies. I present to you the sincere acknowledgments and thanks of the United States for this important mark of your friendship to them. Now, y'all got to understand, I told y'all, George Washington is a politician. He don't want no mess. If he can avoid it, he will, and he does it with his words, as you can see here so very well. He's very good at kissing butt. We greatly regret the hostile disposition of those regencies towards this nation, meaning those people who want to fight us, who have never, who have never injured them. It is not removed 
on terms in our power to comply with. Within our territory, there are no mines of either gold or silver. All right, what he's saying is, look, we ain't got no money. Which he lying. Because that's where they were stealing all their gold and silver from the people. They knew there was gold here. So he's like, within our nation, we don't, we don't have any gold or silver. This is a young nation just recovering from the waste and desolation of a long war. Have not yet had time to acquire riches by agriculture or commerce. But our soil is bountiful and our people industrious. And we have reason to flatter ourselves that we shall gradually become uh, useful to you, to our friends. All right. Encouragement, which our majesty has been pleased and generously to offer our commerce with your, with, with your dominions. Now, let's understand something, because this is what they want to say. Oh, this is what uh, George Washington claimed that uh, uh, the United States was owned by Morocco. Let's first understand, this came in uh, 18 or 1786. Uh, this this piece, this uh, document here, 1789 rather. There are treaties that predate any of this stuff that he had to say. Well, the original people have already made it clear this is our land. The original people have already set up treaties and made it clear this is our land. So how is it going to be stated that this is their dominion? This is their dominion. This is the dominion that they are bullying and trying to make y'all pay tribute. That didn't start until the 1780s. All right. The punctuality with which you have caused the treaty with us to be observed and just and generous measures taken in the case of Captain Proctor. Now, I need to make a deep impression. So what they're saying is these just and generous measures taken in the case of Captain Proctor made a deep impression on the United States and confirmed their respect for an attachment to your imperial majesty. I need you all to understand who this guy is. Captain Proctor, this was a dude who was responsible for finding the original people of the Americas and killing them. That's what he did. That's what they put him on the case to do. So when you look at his legacy and who he was and what he did, this guy would find the original people and kill them. Morocco has hooked them up with Captain Proctor of the United States. Now, what y'all want to recognize and understand is this guy, Captain Proctor, was working on the behalf of the United States to kill off the original people. And here is Morocco some kind of way being kind to them and helping them with this guy. So if you're going to say to me that Morocco was the original people or of the original people, but you got this guy working with the United States to kill off the original people. I, it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe you can present it to me so that it makes sense. But I, if I was the original people and I was looking at uh, Morocco I was, and they hooking the United States of America, who definitely won my people up with this guy who was killing us, I would say Morocco ain't my people either. That's just me. It gives me pleasure to have this opportunity of assuring your majesty that while I remain at the head of this nation, I shall cease to promote every measure that may conclude to the friendship and harmony which so happily subsisted between your empire and them and shall esteem myself happy in every occasion of convincing your majesty of the high sense which in common with whole nation, I entertain the magnanimity, wisdom, and benevolence of your majesty. Look, this guy was a politician, all right? Bottom line, uh, he was working on behalf of England as well. This is Washington. He's work he was a crony. He's working on behalf of England as well. Even though he was so supposedly fighting Britain, nah. Uh, again, a lot of these people were double agents. The original people of the land didn't even know who to fight with. They was back and forth. They didn't know what to, to fight with uh, the, the state 
or to fight with the original people because some of the original people chose to remain uh, non-citizens and some of them chose to subjugate themselves to Britain and pay taxes alright <clears throat> let me carry on with this now I need to get on what the Moroccan Empire is <clears throat> originally as I said the Moroccan Empire was you know a group of melanated folks who had control of North Africa, Spain, uh, some of Italy. They were, they, uh, Portugal. So, one of the things we have to understand is, again, in 1492, that Moroccan Empire came to a halt. But there were fractions still in what, uh, Morocco. But that, that was a different fraction from what we know of today. That was still part of the Moroccan Empire that was running. But it had been chopped down. It wasn't as big as what it was. And they were fading. All right. Now, they teamed up with Britain in the 1500s. And when they teamed up with Britain, they really got infiltrated by Britain. They really, they got infiltrated by Britain. Now, they are really, they part of Britain. They don't know it. Just like most people don't know that the United States, uh, the states, any state of this, state of Texas, state of California, state of this, it's all part of Britain. So, what y'all know of as Morocco today, that is just a state. That's not even dealing with the empire. Those are not even the same people back then of antiquity. That's just a state, a corporation. Where is the Moroccan Empire today? It has no territory. It is in the minds of those who call themselves Moors. Now there's a document, and I encourage you all to go look it up, because I'm running out of time here, and it's called, and I think I have it pulled up. I might be able to go over part of it. It's called, Let's see if I can find it. It's a it's a document coming from Drew Ali. It's a it's a, a document coming from Noble Drew Ali. And let me see if I can pull it up because um, I think I have that already up, and I'm going to try to go through it uh, briefly here. Because what needs to be stated with this document is in this document, it is Noble Drew Ali making a declaration saying that okay all of the lands of the Americas and uh, uh, Africa were once a part of each other in what some of y'all know of as Pangea okay one second uh, of what some of y'all know of as Pangea okay let's, let's, let's just say uh, that that's possible that there was a, a split when the great flood came and this land went that way and that land went that way. Let's understand something. If there are a people on this land and they go that way and this land goes this way, then these two people become the ones who have quote unquote ownership if you will because you really can't own land but let's just say ownership they have the rights to make treaties they become the sovereigns of that land so if this is the territory over here that was Africa and it split up and there were people on that land then Africa would be their land the people on this land this would be their land all right so let's understand something this is you know you over here how are these people going to come over here to this land and claim land in this territory just because, oh, we related to them? They're my cousins. So this our land too. Wait a damn minute. Wait a minute. That's like, okay, you know what that's like. That's like great, 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 great grandmama had a trailer. And that trailer she had four daughters 
and two of the daughters went this way, and two of the daughters went that way. All right? Now, in this trailer, you got these two daughters, and they tore up their trailer. They trailer jacked up, tore up, or they got lost. It, it, whatever happened to it, somebody took it away from them. Whatever. And then there's this trail over here that's still existing. And then these people from this trailer come over here like, oh, these are our cousins. This is our trailer. We're going to take it over. How in the hell are you going to just bust up in my trailer and take claim over something just because we're supposedly related? That ain't how that goes. That is not how that goes. That's not even equity. That's not even fair. And you think about yourself as somebody who was in great, 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 great grandmama's place. And you know great, great grandmama's name. And these people don't even know great grandmama's name trying to claim something. Just because supposedly we relatives. And the only way, reason why they're claiming we relatives is because we got dark skin. Wait a damn minute. You don't even know great grandmama's name. Great grandmama's name wasn't Ali and El and Muhammad and Bay and Day. Those are more names. Remember, great 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 grandmama has got a land patent on the land. And by law, you cannot claim land or claim title to those patents if you don't know the name. You Great grandmama's name over here is Ottawa. Ottawa Truskin over here. And this one over here, like, yeah, I'm Bay Moore. But you're trying to claim great great grandmama's property, but you don't know her name. That's like going to the bank. This is like the bank right here. And, and the name of grandmama bank account is Ottawa Tuskin. Great grandmama name is Ottawa Tuskin, and you trying to legally claim land or claim claim ownership of something, and you don't even know the name of what you're trying to claim. You calling yourself? Uh, uh, you at the bank? Uh, yes, I'm trying to get access to uh, the account. Well, what's the name on the account? Is yeah, um uh, more? No. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Muhammad, Bay, L, Bay, you're not going to get access to this because you don't know the name of the account, of the estate. None of that is equity, what is being presented to you when they're talking about how, oh, because we was over here and we family, we're just going to come over here and claim this. That is not how Equity works. <clears throat> if you're trying to claim land in the Americas, this is why it's important for you to know your own heritage, your background, where you come from. If you're talking about more in Morocco, see, we, we get into Noble Ali's uh, documents. He's saying, oh, these people came from Africa and blah, 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 and then they were Moors. And then one of his big stances was <clears throat> the Peace and Friendship Treaty. Y'all need to go read the Peace and Friendship Treaty. I'm not going to go over it, go into it today because I got to get out of here. But when you read the Peace and Friendship Treaty, what you're going to recognize is it, you might not recognize it, but I want you to pay attention. It does not deal with the land at all. It deals with the people who call themselves Americans and the people who call themselves Moors of Morocco. Now, I need y'all to understand something. These Americans are dark-skinned people. By the way, go look, go look up Americans. Just Google it. Americans, comma, 1848 dictionary. Americans, American, comma, 1848 dictionary and you're going to find the true definition of American American had to do with it was, people with copper color were called Americans <clears throat> when you look at that treaty it's dealing with two people the Americans and the Moors of Morocco 
the thing is how each one of them is going to be treated. All right. Morocco was like, all right, when my people come down to the Americas, then you need to treat them like this and you need to send them back to the Moors. If Moors, if somebody claims to be a Moor and they in uh, 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 the Americas, you need to send them back to us so that we can take care of them and do what we need to do with them. And the same thing, if people come up here in Morocco and they do something, we're going to send them back down there to you. If there's one of your ships that ends up here in Morocco, we're going to do this and, and make sure your ship gets safe out to water. We're going to make sure nobody's able to follow your ship. These are the things that, that that treaty dealt with. Now, let's make it clear. The treaty made it clear that these were two separate lands. Again, when did this treaty come about? 1789. If there was a time Morocco was going to claim to have ownership of the Americas or the United States, it would have been this time during this treaty. But they didn't have anything to say about, oh, we own it. Why? Because they didn't. They didn't own it. And I'm going to tell you all something else. Remember I told you all about the names in that contract. When we looked at that contract coming from the Indians to the United States of America and you look at those treaties, those are the names of the original people. And those are the only people who had sovereignty in the land and the ability to sign any contracts concerning the land. Those original people. Why is that important? Because when you go and look at the Peace and Friendship Treaty, see if you find any of the original people's names. The original people didn't go by names by, like Jones and Smith and Harris. No. They had, they had family names. And none of those names were on the Peace and Friendship Treaty. None of those names were on the Declaration. None of those names were on the Constitution. Anything dealing with land, if it does not have a name of the original people on it, that contract is null and void, and that includes your peace and friendship treaty. If it dealt with land, it not had, it, it's null and void concerning land. Uh, declaration, uh, Constitution, and any other document that doesn't have the original people's name on it, if it's dealing with land, it is null and void. Because the only people who had the right to do anything or sign any contracts concerning the land were the original people of the land. And if you don't see the original people's names on those documents, then you're looking at a document that's null and void concerning any land of the Americas. All right, so we understand who owned the co colonies. That was British who owned the colonies. We understand who owned the United States of America. That was the elite Moors who had set up what we know as counties today. Well, the colonies are, no, are the state, what we know as the states today. And Morocco was joined in with Britain or making sure that they didn't cut off their gravy train. They weren't trying to come in and take over nothing until Britain got their butts kicked. And they got called in by Morocco, by, uh, they called in rather Morocco to come in and beat up on the United States of America. But they, Morocco never owned anything. And if there was a time when they were going to say they owned something, they would have done it in the Peace and Friendship Treaty. But that Peace and Friendship Treaty make it clear that these are two separate countries and two separate nations. All right. Look over the uh, document. I uh, was trying to see if I could find the name of it. Uh, whereby he's stating, you know, he's talking about how the land was won and then they separated. Okay. Okay. If, if we say they separated, that's fine. But how are people from this land going to come over to this land and claim something just because y'all related? That's not how this works. Morocco don't own something just because some people from over here look like the people over here. That's not how that works. And not only that, when we're talking about the Moroccan Empire, I told y'all what y'all know as Morocco today, that is just a state. It, had, it is not even dealing with anything of the people of antiquity. The Moroccan Empire, you know where it exists? Inside the Morris Science Temple. That's where it exists, inside the Morris Science Temple. So what is the Morris Science Temple? It is an infiltrated organization by who? Britain? These so-called modern Europeans? Let me explain something to y'all before I get out of here, and then I'm done. I'm going to hit it and quit it. 
There is your modern European that's light skin. <clears throat> and then there's your Albion. There's a difference because your modern European is really hiding behind your Albions. They're not the same people. What you talking about, Diva? They both light skin. <clears throat> All right. Uh, birds. <clears throat> Excuse me. Birds. <clears throat> I need my water. Where's my agua? <clears throat> agua, please. Waiter, waiter, agua. All right. <clears throat> so now, birds and bats, <clears throat> they have the same, they got wings. <clears throat> they both have wings. They're not the same beast. <clears throat> They're not the same animal. So, excuse me, I don't know where that came from. <clears throat> but yeah, birds and bats, they both have wings. They're not the same animal. All right. So, in understanding that, just because these two people are light-skinned, that doesn't make them the same beings. Let's understand how this works. Again, I told you there are these original people who were coming into the United States. They were considered white, and they were amalgamating themselves. All right, those were people who had royalty, who had power, but they got it through their amal amalgamation. Now, when you want to know who these people are today, look at the people who really are owning things. All right? Look at those families, those families that own all of your major publishing, book publishing companies, television, right? <laughs> uh, that's, uh, somebody said my voice is under attack. Yeah! Stop trying to attack my boys. I'm going to say it. got to say it. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, who own all of your major uh, print companies, uh, all, all of your major television networks, all of your, uh, your anytime you're talking about sports, uh, NFL, in, in, uh, football, basketball, uh, baseball, hockey, those are all owned by the same company. All right? Same companies. Those are your modern Europeans. They look light skin. They got light skin. But those are your modern Europeans. When you're talking about your Albion, your typical quote unquote white people, they don't know nothing. They don't. Your typical white people with names like uh, Johnson, Davis, whatever. By the way, those so-called plantation names, those are Moors. Those are more names. Albions can't trace them names through their Harris, Jones. They can't trace those names through their heritage. But Moors can. So you got to understand who's who. So when you look at <clears throat> your Albion, again, those are the people who, they really not running anything. But when you want to know who your modern Europeans are, oh yeah, they got light skin, but they're not the same as your typical Albion. The ones who run and stuff, look at those families. That's your modern Europeans. So y'all got to understand the difference. And yeah, I'm talking about your, your so-called Jews. How did they go from being dark skin in antiquity to being light skinned today. Well, that's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother topic. We'll get into that. But I want to say, uh, you know, I welcome all of y'all to hear. This is a, 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 a really a deep topic. And I can go on and on about it, but <clears throat> I don't want to, uh, you know, I got to let us go because we got to let class go. Welcome to class, everybody. Welcome to class. All right, so we're here uh, every other Sunday, the third Sunday. Uh, this is the third Sunday. We'll be here on the fifth Sunday, which is going to be the the thirtieth. Okay, because we're going to go over the test. Because there will be a test. We're going to be here on the thirtieth. There will be a test on this information, so that we can uh, see if you get paid because you paid attention. We're going to see if you get paid because you paid attention. Yes, I'm serious. We're giving away gifts and prizes and, and money to those who pay attention. All right, that's part of our new seminar that we're doing. And again, uh, this is called The Truth 
Law and History, you'll see us uh, on three, at 3 p.m. Eastern. 3 p.m. Eastern will be here on the 30th of January um, as we go over the test to see if you get paid because you paid attention. All right, so now, uh, know, know the difference uh, as we get ready to get out of here. Let's see where it is. We get to get out of here. If you have any questions, if you have any questions, I want you to leave them in the comment box, okay? This is UNA University. I'm yours truly, Diva Larie. We're going to see you on the 30th of January, all right? I hope you all have enjoyed the session. I thank you for your time. I thank you for uh, all of you all who have supported us. Listen, we got a great season coming up. I love you all. I love you. I love you. I love you. Oh, my people, for my other sessions Monday, be ready. We got it coming to the information coming to you, okay? Bye, Diva.